from Arab countries, Ethiopia, India, Russia, the former Soviet Union republics, Latin America, the US, and Europe. Refugees from the Arab and Muslim Middle Eastern and North African countries and their descendants make up over half of the Jewish population. These numbers, I'd like to just finish my presentation and do hold a question. It's not a question. I, I wonder if we could turn off the lights so we could read the numbers on the... Oh, thank you. I think well, the lights are already off. out. Oh. Wait, wait, wait. There are 1,658,000 Muslims, there are 6,042,000 Jews, 318,000 Christians compared with 17,000 in 1915, by the way. Um, I guess in the Muslim population it's also important to note that in 1915 there were 590,000 compared to 2015 with 1,000,000. Um, I think I'm going to go on, okay. Um, so these numbers show that the Zionist movement is one of inclusion, not exclusion. Israel enacted affirmative action policies to help its minority citizens achieve full social and economic equality, a fulfillment of the vision of progressive Zionism. Now, the rapid growth of the Arab population was a result of several factors. One was immigration from neighboring Arab states, constituting 37% of the total immigration to pre-state Israel, by Arabs who were attracted to the economic growth in the area. Due to the burgeoning growth and modern developments in this region, there were many positive outcomes for everyone. For an example, the Muslim Arab infant mortality rate fell from 201 per thousand in 1925 to just 94 per thousand in 1945. And life expectancy rose from 37 years in 1926 to 49 by 1943. If anybody wants this, I can send it to you also. I'll print it out later. So what exactly is the Zionist threat to the region? <coughs> Where you have 300 million Arabs in 22 Arab countries and Iran. In 21 recognized Arab countries, <coughs> you have 50 times as many people, 600 times as much land, uh, sorry, 800 times as much land, extensive oil reserves, and not one single democracy. Now, there are 56 nations that have Islamic majorities, 49 nations have Roman Catholic majorities, 20 nations have Protestant majorities, 12 nations with Eastern Orthodox majority, 4 nations with Hindu majorities, and one nation with a Jewish majority that is the size of one twelfth of Oregon. So did Zionism create a racist state? This is Dumasani Washington, an African American Zionist, in a recent talk he gave at San Jose University where he talks about Martin Luther King's legacy on Israel and Israel's diverse community. He refers in here to a question that was posed to Martin Luther King back in 68, just 10 days before he was assassinated and after the 67 war. Oops. That didn't work. Dr. King went on record as standing in defense of the Jewish state and also in very much concern and, if you want to use that word, in solidarity with the Arab people. He was never dismissive 
of their plight and what had happened in terms of all the controversy, the wars, and all those other types of things, which we don't have time to get into on, to, on tonight. So, and in discussing Israel as a society now, I want to harken back to the actual question that Rabbi Gengar asked him. And I have it on the screen here again. And I'm going to read it as we're kind of observing what the rabbis actually say. Dr. King says, <clears throat> What would you say if you were talking to a Negro intellectual, an editor of a national magazine, and were told, as I have been, that he supported the Arabs against Israel because color is all important in this world? In the editor's opinion, the Arabs are colored Asians and the Israelis are white Europeans. Would you point out that more than half of the Israelis are Asian Jews with the same pigmentation as Arabs? Or would you suggest that an American Negro should not form judgments on the basis of color? <clears throat> Dr. King did not address the multi-ethnic diversity of Israel. He simply moved to the race issue on the table. So Dumasani Washington is a founder of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. Did Zion make the apartheid state? People who make such statements, I believe they are exposing their ignorance. Because anybody that has knowledge uh, about what apartheid is cannot make such a ridiculous statement. There has been very painful discrimination in our country in different areas that is not experienced by Palestinians. And uh, I also think that the people who make such statements minimize the pain of those who suffered under apartheid. Because if South Africans, black people like myself, were having the rights that the Palestinians are having today, then there would not have been an armed struggle in South Africa. The fact that they share, they can move their freedom of movement without being arrested. It's something that we did not experience mm -hmm. as South African black people. Mm -hmm. One surprising example I would give is that as a black person moving from a residential place made for black people to another residential place for black people, I needed permission. I could not, I could not move into a different city, not where the white people are, but where the black people live, I could not go there without permission. So to move from one county to the, to the other, to move from one district to the other, I always needed permission. To talk about going to a white area was even worse. You would have to give reasons why you want to go there. So there was no freedom of movement. You look at the issue of transportation. Black people had their own buses, and white people had their own buses. Something that I have not seen in Jerusalem or in Israel. You go to, for medical attention, whether you go to a hospital or to a clinic in South Africa, there were clinics that were just there for white people. And if I had to go to, I needed help and I had to see a doctor, a white doctor that would be kind enough to look at my case, there would have to be a side room or a store room where he could treat me, but he could not go. I could not go where the white people were going. So this, some of these experiences the Palestinians are not experiences because they have the liberty to go to any medical institution they want in the country. So those who are saying uh, Israel is an apartheid state don't know what apartheid really is. Maybe we can... So he went on to explain that in Israel, just before he gave this talk, the president of Israel was 
in court facing an Arab judge, something that would have never happened in South Africa under apartheid. So here we have some of the many faces of Zionism. The first female Bedouin doctor in Israel, proud Israeli, an Israeli Druze IDF colonel. Ishmael Kaldi is a Bedouin Muslim diplomat who came here to speak some years ago. The Israelis teaching our uh, teaching African doctors around the world. And the Baha'i Temple in Israel is the headquarters to the Baha'i religion, where they are persecuted in most of the Middle Eastern countries. Their home in the Middle East is in Israel. <coughs> So part of the Zionist dream was to live freely in a country that would allow Jews to fulfill what they see as their mission in the world, tikkun olam, the healing of the world. This is central to Israeli foreign policy, as you can see here. Israelis are often first responders around the world in disaster areas. There are many programs in Israel bringing Arabs and Jews together to teach them coexistence rather than hate. Another face of Zionism, Chloe Simone Valderi, African-American young woman who is a senior at the University of New Orleans. And I just want you to hear her for just a moment. Thank you. When we speak Zionism, we speak freedom. That is not a hollow slogan. It is not a mantra to be taken for granted. It is something you must realize and you must live out every day of your existence. When we speak Zionism, we speak freedom. We speak of the seat that Rosa Parks sat upon, that she did not give up, that she would not give up. We speak of the sword-holding Maccabees, who never yielded, who never gave in, but were determined to live. We speak of the pen that the Founding Fathers used to write and to fruition their freedom. We speak of the march from Selma to Alabama. We speak of the bellowing voice of Ben-Gurion as the bombs rained down upon Jerusalem, but he stood firm in Independence Hall and did not yield, and did not give in, but issued in a phenomenon unknown to human history, the reestablishment and recreation of an indigenous nation. When we speak Zionism, we speak freedom. So in conclusion, I think you can now see that Zionism has created a multicultural, pluralistic nation that honors people of all races and religions. From its inception in 47, Israel has always accepted the idea of two states, which the Arabs rejected again and again. You have seen that Israel is comprised of Jews, Druze, Arabs, Bedouins, and Christians of every color, a far cry from racism or apartheid. In recent history, Israel even made the daring rescue of Ethiopian Jews, bringing over 100,000 Ethiopians to the safety of Israel where they were given housing and a hope for the future of their children. The beauty of Israel and apartheid and imperfect democracy is that all her citizens are equal before the law and have legal means of recourse in cases of injustice. What makes a democracy great is not perfection, but the opportunity to protest, pursue justice through the courts. And here you have the latest protest in Tel Aviv. I am grateful for the years I spent living in Israel, being an active participant on Kibbutzim and witnessing the evolving state. I hope I've given you a glimpse of the Zionist dream, and I hope that someday you will visit that land and see for yourselves what Zionism has created there. Thank you.
I am an academic, a retired academic, but, and I am a Jew. Um, I deeply distrust Jew. I too sympathize with the trauma of the Jewish people throughout the ages. But I also realize we're dealing with two traumatized people here, not one. <coughs> and that needs to be recognized. The talk showed that the creation of the State of Israel was a success in terms of Israel itself within its boundaries, borders, and governance far beyond what most other Middle Eastern states have achieved. One would rather live in Israel, I'm sure, than in Saudi Arabia, or Jordan, or Iran. That needs to be recognized, acknowledged, and applauded. What is not talked about, never talked about, is what is happening as a continuing oppression in the West Bank and in Gaza. <coughs> Mr. Deke said, don't look back to the past, move on to the present. The present, as we will see from the film called Occupation 101, is a continuing confiscation of Arab-Palestinian land, water, through settlements, now over a half a million Jews, encouraged there, protected there by an occupying army. In terms of moving forward, the UN overwhelmingly wants to move forward. It's difficult but we need to do it. The reason to mention the occupation now is because there was always a big strain in Zionism that never accepted, did anything less than everything that was considered Eretz Israel, original Israel, nothing less was acceptable as a Jewish state. And that goal is being pursued. Now, not all strains of Zionism had that ambition. Some were willing to settle for a portion. I urge you to read in the handout where the map is the first page the statements of people who always, always said, we will take what we can get now but we will get eventually everything. And that includes southern Lebanon, too. And in terms of threats to the region, the, a repeated invasion of southern Lebanon by Israel suggests some of the ways that this has spilled out well over the borders. Enough said about that. Uh, you'll see the brutality of the occupation and the way that uh, people are being terribly traumatized to this day and feel that they have no future except to be squeezed out. Now let me talk a bit about Zionism that fills in some of the gaps. In the first place, the history of the land of Palestine did not begin with the Jews. He, ancient Hebrews moved into that land. Other people lived there. They moved in with the force of arms. If you read Deuteronomy 20, whoever wrote that atrocious passage calling for ethnic cleansing, the murder of every man, woman, child, and their animals from certain peoples who already lived there, you see that there was a struggle Israel, Jews did not occupy that land forever. There was a conquest, there were reconquests. 
This is not something that started when Jews were, con were conquered by other people. Jews conquered people. Then they were conquered. There was a continual presence in Israel, in Palestine, but very few. You see the, you see the population statistics in the handout. Uh, and they were not Zionists. They lived on the land and they lived peacefully. Those few, a small number. Uh, and you'll see in the film that many of those were distressed by what happened with Zionism. Now let me go back to the beginning of early Zionism. Early Zionism, I, I was rather surprised uh, with the statement that Zionist aspiration was to gain independence from the British. That was not the original modern Zionist aspiration. That became much later when they were trying to get out from British rule, having well established through several ways of immigration, uh, a, 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 a big presence. And then they became uh, militant opponents of Britain. But the original Zionist aspiration came out of Russia. Theodore Herzl was a Russian. It became a, a, a response to terrible pogroms. Uh, and everything that uh, Zanishan said about the oppression of Jews in Europe is accurate and painful and shameful. It's also true, though, that when they were being oppressed by, we were being oppressed by Christians in Europe, we found a safe haven for centuries in Muslim countries. And it's one of the great tragedies of the founding of Israel that has destroyed a good relationship, a century-old flourishing relationship. It's one of the historical tragedies. But originally the goal was not, Herzl's goal was not the creation of a state in Israel as once again a return to the Davidic kingdom or whatever. He just wanted a place where Jews could be safe. Israel was one of those possibilities. Very few people in Eastern and uh, uh, Europe and the, Russia chose to go to Israel. The first wave was a very small wave of Jews into Israel. A huge wave came to the United States. That's where my, that's when my grandparents came. I bet that's where a lot of your grandparents came. Uh, about 30,000 Jews went to Israel, well over a million Jews came here to find safety and freedom, and by and large we did. Um, Herzl was willing to negotiate with anybody who might give a home. It, there was even a consideration in, at the fifth Jewish uh, World Zionist Conference in 1903 of accepting a British offer of a homeland in East Africa, and Bob Harrison mentioned that. It was rejected, but nonetheless, there was a thought, and then, thanks to a Weissman and Lord Rothschild, they had common cause with, Israel, with England, because England turned out to be the most hopeful supporter. They also tried in Germany, they tried with the Turks, so it wasn't, it, for a long time, Britain served the purpose of Zionists. It was only when they stopped serving the purpose of Zionists that it became a liberation. Another thing. The statement that people who were living in, Arab Muslims who were living in what was ceded by the UN to, to Israel left because they were told to leave by Arabs, other Arab states, or they voluntarily did, is an atrocious lie for the most part. 
The Israeli Jews had organized militarily very effectively long before 1948. Uh, they had a 12,000-person army. Uh, they had paramilitary forces, the Stern Gang of Ern. Uh, and they started going into these villages, and there were massacres, and scared the shit out of these people. The word spread very quickly. This was before the, the Arab, neighboring Arab nations invaded. And they fled. They fled in terror. Did a few involuntarily? Only if you mean that they didn't go by the point of the gun, they fled because they were so scared. I just wanted to correct that because that's something that has never been spoken of. Um, I want to stop there. I, the narratives tend to be mostly true but terribly one-sided. The Israeli narrative that we heard, it was mostly true, not entirely, in my view, not entirely frankly true, but, but excludes so much. And the Palestinian narrative tends to do that too. And one needs to, when you listen to people, you have to say not only, oh, is what they're saying true, but are they leaving out enormously important parts of the story? And this is true whether you're listening to a Palestinian narrative or whether you're listening to an Israeli narrative. And, and our job as peacemakers is to try to hear both narratives and figure out a more comprehensive narrative so that we can find a more comprehensive piece. Now uh, yeah, we'll open it up to questions. Does somebody want to move the mic around? Uh, do we have somebody be willing to take the mic? Um, put up your hands, please, and the mic, the mic will come to you first, first here. So in Arafat's own biography, he talks about the radio stations that played um, calling for Arabs to please leave their homes, uh, and he discusses what that was like for his family. So um, I know there's many more accounts of that, but are you claiming that, that, that Arafat's own account of, is false? Because from the description that many Arabs have given, uh, the radio stations were playing propaganda much similar to what happened in Rwanda prior to the genocide of enticing and calling to people to align themselves with their fellow Arab brothers and leave their homes. And then you say these massacres occurred. Other than the revolt in Hebron, I know of no such uh, bloodshed where these massacres occurred. Can you please name one? Yeah, Bob, you, you, you used the term, uh, I can't remember the name. Dury Asim. Dury Asim. There were just shootings of men, women, and children, not just in defense of them. Now, this is well documented. You can, that you can go, you, there are plenty of records, there are plenty of official records, but, but I do not wish to uh, deny what you're saying about the broadcast. But people tend not to lose, leave their homes willingly. I mean, you and I will not leave our homes willingly. We leave our homes under compulsion of various kinds. So, so the picture is mixed. I don't mean to say it was all one thing or all another thing, but it's really important for people to understand the whole narrative. And, 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 and the, the Israeli narrative that they were perfectly willing to have all these 400 villages which just disappeared from the map stay there and live peacefully is not true. It is not true any more than the current occupation in the West Bank with the continued confiscation of, of Arab land is because the people are willingly abandoning their land. They're not.
Uh, so I want to say your presentation was very interesting, but I want to confess to the fact that I couldn't buy into it all. Um, as I'm aware, and probably most of us in the audience are aware, it's easy to pick out speakers and factual material that will be very convincing to an argument, and in this case it's in support of Zionism. Um, and I, and, I, and I, think, I think that was in some sense uh, representative or represented in your presentation. For example, I wanted to point out that I think you, I mean, it, it's obvious that there are many Arab countries surrounding or in the area of Israel. Thus, it would seem that Israel is the sort of the small, unlucky guy on the block because it's surrounded by um, haters, if you will. I think the, the fact is that with some exceptions, those Arab countries, and, and by some exceptions I mean particularly recently, are countries that don't strike out against perceived grievances. They're not working on acquisition of additional territories to expand, expand their, um, as we call it, national urban growth boundaries. And so therein lies my biggest problem, I think, with Zionism. Um, and, that, and I just wonder if you could comment on that. Um, so, yes, I would like to respond to it. Um, yes, I did choose speakers who support Zionism, of which there are many in Israel. Um, the surrounding Arab lands, being expansive, are not looking to expand, that's clear. They are also not granting rights to their own citizens. Gays, lesbians, women, who are all suffering under those regimes, they are not in Israel. I wanted to share that back in 1975, when I was in Israel, and I knew nothing about the history of the Palestinians at that time, and I met a young man who was serving in the Israeli army, and he, I asked him about it, and he said, well, I'm not going to tell you, I'm going to take you to an Arab cafe in East Jerusalem, and let, let's ask the Palestinians. So we did that. And he took me to a cafe, we sat with our peers, and I asked them what it's like living in this country, this Jewish country. And they told me they are happy here in Israel. They are prospering. Their families are prospering. Their cousins in Jordan are subhuman. They knew it back then. It's not different today. And Israel is not land grabbing. Because, you know, in 2005, Israel returned Gaza to the Palestinians. What happened? Israel was barraged by rockets that have not ended till today. Right? They have autonomy in Gaza. Hamas rose up, a terrorist organization who terrorizes their own people. The Palestinians are victims of their own government. In the West Bank, you'll hear later um, when Rabbi David speaks to the security concerns of Israel, and you can look at the maps and see Israel's indefensible borders if terrorists were to come into the West Bank and take hold. Uh, I, I do want to comment on that and on Gaza. The, the few settlements in Gaza were withdrawn because it became impossible to maintain sufficient security forces to protect them. Do they have autonomy? They have been under a blockade, a strangling blockade, for seven years. Very few things can get in. Life is miserable in Gaza. They can't get in, they can't get out. The borders are closed to, it's for, to Israel, their borders are closed to Egypt. Uh, were rockets fired? Absolutely. It was a, a very wrong thing to do. It was an act of desperation. Hamas, I think, visited terror on its own people by doing that. It provoked a huge and terrible retribution. But Gaza is really very much under the control of Israel. I, I, I just need to say that. It's not being occupied. It's surrounded by a, a strangling blockade. I want to 
you respond to the fact the daughter of Ismail Haniya, who is rocketing Israel, has been treated in hospital in Israel along with thousand Palestinians every year. That is, that is really a tribute to Israel that, that their hospitals will treat the people that the Israeli army forces wound. Uh, that's, no, 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 she wasn't wounded. No, uh, and, 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 and for his brother-in-law oh, 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 that had a heart attack. Oh, okay, that is a real tribute to Israel. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's not a one-sided, it's not a one-sided narrative. No, 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 I'm balancing, I'm balancing out as best I can, and we need to do that. Uh, because historically in this country, as a matter of fact, we've only heard the Israeli narrative. It's only in, in recently that uh, enough people have been coming forward, including an increasing number of Jews who are distressed, as I am, by, by the victimization of, of the Palestinians to, to speak. Uh, I just want to respond briefly to this um, story of the blockade on um, Gaza. So the blockade is in place to prevent weapons being brought in. And we can see what happens when cement was allowed in. Gazans build hundreds of tunnels that tunnel under Israeli kibbutzim and villages, under Israeli kindergartens, with the intent, intent of kidnapping and bringing those Israelis into Gaza, because why? They know that Israel's value, Israel values life above all else, as we saw with Gilad Shalit, who was freed after five years under Hamas rule. Right? He was taken and kidnapped an Israeli soldier from Israel. He was held and only released in exchange for over 1,000 terrorists, many with blood on their hands. That's how Israel values life. I have a mic. Uh, we'll, look, we'll watch some more voices. I have a mic. I have a mic. Who? I have a mic and I have a question. Uh, I, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> right under your nose. Two close under your if I remember the slides correctly, it was indicated that 830,000 Arabs fled Israel in 1947, becoming refu refugees in the neighboring lands. And a bit later, it was indicated that that number now exceeds 4 million. What explains that growth in number? And has there been no return? I think that you can correct me, neighboring lands uh, in, in, because in Jordan at that time was part of the West Bank. Uh, for, uh, country, with, the West Bank at that time was part of Jordan. A lot of them fled there. Uh, but also there's been population growth. Interestingly, there are now more uh, Palestinians living in the diaspora than they are in Palestine. But it's also true that the Arab countries are very much at fault, very much at fault for, for keeping uh, these, these uh, Palestinians in the camps and not opening themselves up. Uh, there is a lot of blame to go around, a lot of blame. Right here, My question is this, I, I've heard mentioned both on the screen and on the stage, uh, that <clears throat> that the Israeli government uh, allows and gives uh, all the rights to the Arabs living in their country, and yet what's happening in the West Bank and in Gaza belies that statement. And so I'm wondering uh, if part of this, is it really a class struggle? Because it seems that the ones that are focused, uh, that have all the rights, seem to be very well educated and have integrated, apparently. But those who have not, who are continually seeing their homes bulldozed and the land that was theirs squeezed more and more to the point where soon there won't be any. Those people who farm the land, etc., they are less educated and they are less affluent. And so I'm wondering if part of this isn't just a class struggle that we're talking about here. So you have to differentiate between the Arabs 
Muslim or Christian who live within Israel proper and are Israeli citizens. They have full rights. Is Israel a perfect democracy? No. Do they have to fight for their rights sometimes? Yes, just like we did here in the civil rights movement. And today, we are still doing that, right? African Americans are still defending their rights. Israel is not different, but you're talking about the West Bank and Gaza, which are not in Israel. Gaza is run by um, Hamas. West Bank the West Bank is under the Palestinian Authority. But you can't you, I mean, you must acknowledge that the Palestinians, like the black Americans, African Americans, are trying to, are speaking for their freedom, for their rights, and yet their rights, their freedom, seems to be denied in the same way that uh, you are saying that the Israelis, the Jews, have, are fighting for their freedom. But denied by you. If, if both parties are fighting for the same thing, then they should be able to recognize that in each other instead of forcing the diaspora. I mean, the Jews have gone through the diaspora. Now, the Palestinians are facing that. So it seems like there should be some ground for common understanding that we don't have and are not seeing because we're only seeing in those opposite abstract sense about, about what is right for me, not right for you. Well, that still has to be figured out, but again, they are not living, uh, uh, they are not Israeli Arabs. And the question is really who is keeping them from being a free people? Who is keeping them in that position? It's been the Arab people who have actually kept them in a refugee status, which is why there are 4.2 million refugees today, instead of no Jewish, as the Jewish refugees. We have a question back <coughs> Um, yes, I first I got here late and I have to leave soon, so there's probably things I missed at the beginning of your dialogue. It's going to come later. I won't be here for. But I think one of the reasons this issue is so divisive is because there's a tendency, and I've seen this already here, to become preoccupied with fighting back the most polarized claims rather than focusing in the more nuanced and thorough parts of it, um, such as your slides on is a Israel is Israel a racist? No, is Israel an apartheid state? No. And the dialogue that uses comparisons to South African apartheid and to the Holocaust to criticize modern Israel, I think, are counterproductive and intellectually dishonest. Um, that being said, um, you took you said very recently. Uh, Is, is, uh, Israel's concern is preserving life, something to that effect. I disagree. Israel's concern is security, whether that be military or economic. I think that's true for most modern states. Um, second of all, I agree with you over the apartheid claim. Um, it's both false and non productive in this context. However, while applying understanding of American, American racial politics to other countries can be problematic sometimes. I think it's useful in this context for comparing, you know, the imperfections of America to the imperfections of Israel. In that, while well, I agree with the parking plan, I do think Israel's right to say that. I've been there, I've talked at length and traveled through Israel. Um, an example of the Ethiopian immigrants you um, put forward, I have a few very good friends in Israel who are of Ethiopian descent. Um, and what was not mentioned so far, I don't know if it was mentioned before I came in, it's been gone for a few hours, is uh, the um, forced population control of the Ethiopian population by um, the Israeli medical establishment. Uh, what else? Can you explain that? I've never heard of that. You covered a lot. Uh, and make good points. Maybe we, we need to wrap it up for lunch. Maybe. Would you like to say anything before we go to lunch? The last word is yours. The last word is yours. Yes, I actually would. So I think we've heard a lot here. Um, after lunch, you'll be seeing a film that, in my opinion, is very one sided and balanced. I would ask you to keep something in mind when you watch this film. Who actually makes up the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces? Every Israeli serves 
men and women, doctors, lawyers, nurses, teachers, everybody across the board serves in that army. So when you watch what they're going to show you here, keep that in mind. Thank you. Well, Ayala, I want to thank you so much for being part of the program. It's so important that people perceive that in these events, all voices are being heard, and I hope people are feeling that way. Um, perhaps you'd like to hear more of one or more of another. The day is still young, and hopefully before it's over, we'll have listened to each other well enough so that, as this young man said, we can not worry so much about the most extreme stances and charges, but we can start trying to find common ground. So enjoy lunch. If you can make a contribution to lunch, uh, please do it.